From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. Here's what's ahead. K-State's Dallas Peterson and Marshall Hay will talk about herbicide strategies for controlling heavy weed infestations in wheat stubble going into the fall. Their field trials have centered on the use of an alternative to glyphosate with good results. They'll tell us about it. Also, K-State's Jesse Tack and Noah Miller will report on their new study, which looked at the historical response of grain sorghum yields to warming temperatures in Kansas over the last 40 years. They determined the point at which those higher temperatures start to erode yields and examined the impact of planting sorghum earlier than normal on those yield results. And later, with his weekly commentary on rural Kansas, K-State's Gus Vanderhoven right here on Agriculture Today. Agricultural producers, landowners, and creditors, you have a partner in your legal and financial needs. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services offers reliable, trusted information and guidance. Whether you need advice for ag credit concerns or are transitioning your operation to the next owner, Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services can assist you in making sound decisions for your business. To learn more, call 800-321-3276 or visit us online. You're listening to the K-State Radio Network and glad to have you along once more for Agriculture Today. We're following up on a conversation we had yesterday with a K-State agronomist about the importance of controlling weeds in wheat stubble following this past harvest and heading into another growing season. But the approach to getting after those weeds is what we'll deal with more today. And moreover, how to control those thicker stands of weeds, which may look a little foreboding as one considers controlling them. Joining us now is weed management specialist Dallas Peterson. K-State Research and Extension, and a graduate research assistant in weed science at K-State, Marshall Hay, and they have conducted field trials looking at this very matter of arresting these large weeds, and we do have that problem out there again this year, Dallas. Right, and we never recommend waiting to treat large weeds, but inevitably it seems like it happens, and there's a, a myriad of reasons why, you know, they might get away from us. And then we're struggling to try to control them, whether that's, uh, you know, lack of rainfall and hot, dry weather and the herbicides don't work well and we delay our treatments or too much rainfall and and the weeds just kind of grow like crazy when it gets hot and get away from us. You know, we always suggest uh, treating in a timely manner when the weeds are small, but that doesn't always happen. And you talk about weed stubble. And oftentimes, again, you know, the costs uh, become an important factor there. And so we got a little lazy a few years ago, I'd say, when, you know, we had that silver bullet, the uh, Roundup and the Roundup 2,4-D combinations. And even if they got away from us, it seemed like we could still control that Palmer amaranth especially, but also the kochia. And that's just not working anymore. Uh, with glyphosate. And so, again, timeliness is a critical, but sometimes they get away from us, and then we need to look at alternatives uh, that we can use to try and manage those weeds. And there are alternatives, and you and Marshall have taken a look at those, right? Yeah, we've evaluated some different uh, options. Uh, again, I, I would emphasize you know, whenever they get too big, we're probably not going to get as good a control as we would like. One other objective besides just controlling those weeds is preventing seed production uh, as well. And unfortunately, if you've already produced some seed out there, you're probably not going to reduce the viability of those seed that have already been produced. But still, maybe you can prevent further production of seed, and that will be beneficial in the long run as well. And Marshall, bring you in. One of those chemical alternatives here is a product that is not new by any stretch of the imagination, but it has merit in this situation where weeds have really gotten after it and have become thick and tall. And that is Paraquat, right? Yeah, and, and you know, to be honest with you, I, I don't like the idea of spraying Paraquat on thick and tall weeds. Whenever we're in this situation, regardless of the control tactic we're going to implement, I think it's important to have realistic expectations and and to be focusing those on more of suppression, reducing weed seed production, like Dallas mentioned, rather than complete control that we might experience earlier in the year when we're in that ideal situation. With Paraquat, though, um, it's a contact-type herbicide, so it's not going to be 
mobile in plants, similar to like glyphosate, that's a systemic herbicide. So it moves in the plant. And really, that covers up a lot of application problems, such as low carrier volumes and stuff like that, that we can get away with with glyphosate. Really, when we go to Paraquat, it's a paradigm shift. A contact herbicide, we're going to be looking at needing better coverage, at different droplet sizes, and, and things like that. Those are the kind of things that we looked at in our research. Let's talk about, for one thing, application considerations here. Sure. You're, you're wanting a, a coarser droplet to make sure that product um, stays put? Or what? Well, and, and, and so if you want to talk about the different nozzle terminologies out there, a lot of times people say a, a small droplet or something like that for better better coverage because you're going to produce more of them. What I like to refer to is kind of our industry standard droplet classifications. So if you look in, and what I'm talking about there is we have this in the e-update, but if you look in a nozzle selection guide from any of the major manufacturers, they're going to offer different droplet size classifications for each given nozzle and pressure that that nozzle is operated at. What we would like to see, and with our research, uh, we sprayed multiple different droplet sizes on pigweed and to determine which droplet size is really the most effective or the most optimal droplet size to ensure the most herbicide gets to the target site inside of those plants. And what we saw is anything that's kind of in that medium to coarse droplet range. Um, and what I'm talking about there is anything in like the two to 300, uh, maybe 350 micron uh, diameter. So it's important to understand when I say uh, the medium to coarse, that doesn't mean raindrops here. Uh, they're still pretty small droplets, but that's going to give us the best coverage out there on our pigweeds. Um, one problem that I've personally bumped into working with several producers is the use of their TTI or extend dicamba type nozzles that they might be using in the dicamba soybeans, using those for other contact herbicides, be it in soybeans in crop or even spraying paraquat with them. Those nozzles are designed to reduce drift and have very large or ultra coarse is what we describe the, no the droplet size as ultra coarse spray droplets. That's not going to provide an effective way of getting paraquat to the target site. It's simply not going to offer the coverage that we need. And our research reflects that. We went all the way up to 900 microns, which is beyond an ultra course. And we can see that the control definitely drops off when we get to that. So really, there's not a generic statement that you could make saying use larger spray droplets. Actually, there's a balance there we're looking for. A happy medium, Exactly. If you will. So in that medium to course transition is where we're going to find the way to reduce driftable finds and still have good coverage. And Marshall talked about the different classifications of droplet sizes. So when we talk about coarse, there's also several larger droplets than that that get into very coarse and ultra coarse and extra coarse and that mm -hmm. sort of thing. And, and really, again, a lot of new tips uh, developed in the last uh, you know five to ten years. And and really, when we're spraying Paraquat, we probably want to avoid most of the Venturi air induction type mm -hmm. of tips because they get into those larger droplet spectrums. Mm -hmm. And rates to consider here, did you come up with a, a standard rate that seems to be most effective and most economical for the producer? I think what we're getting into there is the carrier volume. And really, we didn't get into that with this research that was in the e-update. But generally speaking, we need the more carrier volume, the better. Now, I, I've, I've been out there in the field working with guys, and it's easy to say, you know, more carrier volume, 20 gallons per acre. We'd love to have that. That is definitely going to help us get the best control, especially on those thick, tall stands of weeds. But I'm going to say the, the more you can get out there, the better off you're going to be in terms of getting control of these, these thick, tough-to-control stands of weeds. And really, 15 gallon per acre, an absolute minimum. Uh, and again, I would agree. ideally, 20 to 25 gallon per acre. Because mm -hmm. we, we want the coverage, you know, with the higher volumes, we'll get more droplets, even with the larger droplet size. And so we want that surface coverage, but we also want penetration down uh, into that canopy as best we can. Now here, you're talking about Paraquat as a standalone treatment. Any cause for tank mixes whatsoever? I think there's a lot of opportunities with tank mixes with Paraquat from two different aspects. The first aspect that a lot of us maybe don't think about is the potential to reduce the risk of herbicide resistance. So right now we do not have any herbicide resistance to Paraquat in Kansas. 
That doesn't mean it's not ever going to happen. Eventually, it's inevitable. We will have weeds resistant to paraquat. It's just a matter of selecting for them. So things we can do with that is one option is to tank mix another effective herbicide with it. That's not only going to help reduce the risk of herbicide resistance, but we've also seen where it can increase the efficacy of paraquat, especially in these difficult-to-control situations. One of our favorite group of herbicides to tank mix with paraquat are what we call the photosystem 2 inhibitors. A lot of us might refer to those as the triazine-type herbicides, things like atrazine, metribuzin, or linuron. Find a way to bring that into the tank mix. Of course, that has to be compatible with your crop rotation right. as well. You right. know, if you're planning to plant wheat this fall, uh, those are not an option. But uh, if you're planning to rotate the, the corn or sorghum the following year, of course, atrazine is, is kind of a standard uh, tank mix there. Uh, if you're planning to go to soybeans, then metribuzin would be the better alternative to look at. But there's one notable exception. Putting paraquat in the mix with glyphosate is not a good idea. Kind of, and we've kind of bumped into that through some anecdotal evidence from the field talking with producers that prompted us to do a more expanded study on that. And what we've seen is there's definite antagonism out there when we combine paraquat with the glyphosate. Now, Dallas, you say with any tank mix alternative here, there is value in adding an adjuvant product. And really, whether it's a tank mix or not, paraquat does need to have an adjuvant with it. And historically, non-ionic surfactant uh, has proven to be as good and consistent as any adjuvant out there. Uh, But you need either a non-ionic surfactant or some sort of an oil. And actually, if you're tank mixing uh, with one of the other triazing products or uh, or even sharpen for that matter, the oils probably are more effective in that tank mix uh, combination. Uh, but again, adjuvants are uh, absolutely necessary, and you always want to refer to the label or those adjuvant recommendations. Well, there are more considerations to this topic. We would refer folks to, as Marshall said, the e-update article that was posted this past Friday, August the 10th, on controlling tall, thick stands of weeds in wheat stubble and uh, fully incorporated in that, the information that you've generated on Paraquat as an option of choice here. So check that out, growers at agronomy.ksu.edu, the latest e-update newsletter out of K-State. Marshall, Dallas, thanks for being over as always. Been our pleasure. Thank you. Dallas Peterson, weed management specialist, K-State Research and Extension, and a graduate research assistant in weed science at Kansas State. Marshall Hay, Agriculture Today returns in a moment on the K-State Radio Network. Agriculture and food systems are the main drivers of the Kansas economy, but must be improved in order to feed the world's growing population. How are we going to do so? reduce food loss, find ways to preserve grasslands, and help families stretch their dollars. Global Food Systems is one of the five grand challenges K-State Research and Extension is addressing. To learn more, visit www.ksre.ksu.edu. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and welcome back. And for you here, a quick preview of information that will be shared later on this week. At the Risk and Profit Conference here at Kansas State University, hosted by the Agricultural Economics Department, it gets at a very intriguing question about one of our leading row crops in Kansas, that being grain sorghum, how that crop would likely respond to increasing temperatures as part of the warming climate. Joining us now, Jesse Tack, an agricultural economist at K-State and a graduate researcher in that department, Noah Miller. They authored this work. Jesse, want to ask you, first of all, what inspired this very in-depth study? Yeah, well, um, I've been studying sort of crop yield and weather relationships for, uh, for a while now. But I was at Mississippi State University before here. And we didn't have much sorghum down there. And so this was kind of a a new crop for me. And I started talking to some people about its production. And one of the things that that I thought was really interesting was it, you know, it has this reputation as increased sort of heat resiliency and also drought tolerance. But then it also happens to be the case that it gets planted much later in the season. And so it's not going head to head with corn or beans. It's getting planted much later in the season. And so it might have some heat resilience properties, but it's also, 
you know, getting hit with July and August heat right during its reproductive phase. So I kind of wanted to see just how those two things sort of balanced out. It has increased heat resilience, but it also gets grown at a very hot time of year. And so which which of those things was going to kind of dominate? So you and Noah, to get at that very question, got together quite an assortment of data and cross-referenced it. Noah, you might speak to that. There's a lot of detail to this study. Yeah, For the data set, we had to compile um, several data sets. One came from the Kansas Farm Management Association. Uh, They had production data going back to 1978 that we used to collect for grain sorghum yields. Um, We also collected local weather data that we could match to the KFMA yield data we have. And so we got daily min and max temperatures and precipitation for all the locations that we were looking at in Kansas. And then finally, we used USDA NAS data on crop progress reports to see when sorghum was being planted and when it was being harvested. Going back to 1978, you say? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the idea here was to see what specified increases in temperature renders upon the yield of that crop. You tried to match those up then, right? Yes. And so we were looking especially at extreme heat because we know that sorghum has been considered an alternative for corn because of its heat properties. So we wanted to know, how does it tolerate extreme heat? And how is, Jesse, extreme heat defined here? Yeah, so it's kind of different for every crop and location combination, and it's one of those things where you can use the data itself to try and identify at what point temperature exposures above a threshold really start reducing yields. And for these particular data, it was found to be about uh, 91 degrees Fahrenheit. That was the point at which temperature exposures at 91 and above really started to correlate with reduced yields. And the extent of reduced yields, you you quantified that step by step as well, did you not? Yeah. Yeah, this is the tricky part because you have an entire growing season worth of temperature exposures. Every single day, every single second, the plant is being exposed to temperature. And so you need to have some sort of mechanism by which you kind of simulate a new growing season, right? So you can take average temperatures or take the temperatures at every single day for an entire growing season and then just go back and simply add another degree to it and thus simulate sort of a new weather profile or a new climate for that particular location. So that was the goal here, was to use the historical data to understand the relationship between the yields and the weather, and then to simulate a new weather outcome that would be indicative of a warming climate. And you found, Noah, that the drain, if you will, on yields as that temperature tends to be warmer could be pretty significant, right? Yes, it tended to be outweigh the magnitude of uh, any positive productive heat, Um, and it created significant losses. So we saw that if you did increase temperature by 2 degrees Celsius, you would see a decrease on average of 25% in yield. So a quarter of your yield would be gone. Wow. And if you hike it up 3, 4, 5 degrees Celsius warmer, clearly the yields would suffer even more, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's just kind of one of these things where as you start accumulating more exposure over that 91 degrees Fahrenheit threshold, it just gets worse and worse and worse. Now, these yield detriments you point out in your write-up and in your presentation do vary place-to-place within the state of Kansas, don't they? Sure, they do. Um, And I think that's partially due to the weather differences that you see in between western southwestern Kansas and northeastern Kansas in precipitation terms and in terms of temperatures. Then you took it one further and said, what if? What if there was a shift in the planting date and therefore the harvesting date for a grain sorghum stand? That is to say, by planting earlier, would that help alleviate some of the yield dings that would be taken with these heightened temperatures? Yeah, so I I guess the first thing I'd say is big picture you know, the sort of stuff we're estimating is, is what we'd call in economics a, like a short-run impact. It largely holds constant everything, which means that, that there's no adaptation, which we know is going to happen. We know there's going to be adaptation to a warming climate. It's just not clear how we can make use of that inside of a statistical model to, like, 
temper our results. So that's really where the interesting research in these areas is being done right now is considering different adaptation mechanisms. And there can be very sophisticated adaptation mechanisms of switching to different crops, changing growing locations, putting a lot of money into research and development on the genetic side of things. You know, there's a lot of different ways we can adapt. The simplest way to adapt is to do everything as we've been doing and let's just put the seed in the ground a little bit earlier. So that that was the one we're taking on here, not because we think it's the most kind of leverageable adaptation strategy, just because from a practical standpoint, from a like a, uh, an economic kind of transaction cost, there's almost none to just planting a little bit earlier. So it seemed like a good one to check out, at least from like a theoretical standpoint, to see if there was much leverage there. And if you study one of these things and it has a big reduction in the yield impacts, if there is a lot of adaptation potential, then you can kind of put a pin in it and move on, right? Mm, right. We'll easily adapt. So you applied that adaptation. How early are we talking here? Uh, How far back is the planting date being pushed, Noah? Well, so we faced a couple constraints in terms of pushing it back because sorghum needs higher temperatures for soil germination. Additionally, the, the RMA has best practices for the farm where um, planting can't occur before a certain date. To maintain insurance to ma- eligibility. Exactly. And so we allowed for a three-week window, and then we moved back as far as we could, as long as the minimum temperature was similar to the one that we saw when we hadn't taken into account warming. And so on average, we saw that farms could reduce the yield losses that they faced by moving back the planting date by a couple weeks, two weeks. But the mitigation in yield losses was only very small. So we'd only see a few percentage points being knocked off of that yield loss. It doesn't completely correct the yield loss that no. is incurred by higher temperatures. Then. Yeah, the extent to which it'll offset the impacts is really, really small. The way we put it together and the, and the way we simulate it, it's not a very viable adaptation path. There's definitely an indication from this research that we need to explore other adaptation pathways for sure. And that's the takeaway. This is not a complete answer to the question as to how sorghum will react in the future as we see uh, temperatures continue to warm. So still more research to be done and hopefully come up with a solution that goes beyond just adjusting planting dates. That's the hope here. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of opportunities out there to um, learn more about how these production systems could stay the same or change and what the best course of action is going forward. Not everyone agrees on what climate change is going to look like, mm-hmm. but there's some suggestions that it's going to move in a direction where production's going to become a little bit more challenging. So let's try and uh, prepare for that possibility. This will be good baseline information to contribute to that ongoing dialogue. It's quite intriguing work, and thanks to the both of you for reporting to us today on it, and hopefully you'll get some good feedback at Risk and Profit later on this week on this very matter as well. We appreciate your time. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. They're over from the Agricultural Economics Department at K-State, Jesse Tack and Noah Miller. Once more, they are the co-authors of this study that looked at this question, can adjustment of planting dates offset the warming impacts of the climate for Kansas sorghum producers. As you check out the material from Risk and Profit following the event, you can find that information, so be looking for that on agmanager.info in the coming days. You're listening to Agriculture Today, and we'll return in a few moments with more on the K-State Radio Network. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test. Fix. Save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station.
You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, our Wednesday edition, and welcome back. Eric Atkinson here. Over to today's agricultural news page and these headlines now, courtesy in part of DTN. Well, shares in Bayer AG fell sharply Monday after Monsanto, which the German chemical company recently acquired, was ordered to pay $289 million in a landmark lawsuit over whether exposure to two of its glyphosate herbicides caused cancer. That ruling by a California state jury last Friday found that Monsanto's Roundup and Ranger Pro products presented a quote, substantial danger to consumers and that the company knew or should have known the potential risks they posed. That case, the first of many that could go to trial and represents a a nagging issue for Bayer, which closed its $60 billion plus acquisition of Monsanto back in June after two years of wrangling with that. Monsanto said that as of February, it had a recorded liability of $254 million relating to various product claims and that it's aware of 5,200 plaintiffs who claim to have been injured by exposure to glyphosate-based products. The company had previously said it could not estimate losses from the litigation. Bayer said Monday that the jury's verdict was at odds with the weight of scientific evidence, decades of real-world experience, and the conclusions of regulators around the world, as it stated. Bayer also noted that the verdict remains subject to post-trial motions and an appeal. A spokesperson added that Bayer's involvement in the case and its ability to comment further are currently restricted by U.S. antitrust arrangements. Bayer shares on Monday closed at nearly a five-year low, falling 10 percent to just over $95 a share. U.S. Ambassador to China Terry Branstad said in remarks in Iowa over the weekend that it's not clear how long the U.S.-China trade frictions will continue. He said that, quoting here, we are continuing to have discussions and that he's trying to keep the leaders in Washington informed and do all that they can. Again, quoting, we've had several meetings and we are going to continue to work on it. Branstad said that U.S. Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin has been in talks with Chinese officials over the past two weeks, so the countries are trying to negotiate, he said. He also said that President Trump is justified in putting tariffs on imports of Chinese goods into the U.S. He said that China is in worse financial condition than the U.S. due to the drop in that nation's stock market and currency value. Speaking at the Iowa State Fair, Branstad said it was unfortunate that American farmers have been collateral damage in the trade war, and he is unsure where or what it will take for China to finally cut a deal with the United States. More certainty was the buzzword for acting EPA Administrator Andrew Wheeler in his visit to the Iowa State Fair over the weekend. He offered a few specific details on how to deliver that, particularly on the issue of the renewable fuel standard. Wheeler said that the agency was going to come up with a new proposed relative to the proposal, that is, relative to the waters of the United States rule within the next 60 days. The certainty there, he said, would come with farmers not having to hire an attorney attorney to understand what is and is not a wetland. Farmers, he said, will be able to understand the law better to make their decisions. On the renewable fuel standard, Wheeler said it was an important program, not just for the state of Iowa, but for the entire country. Noting the Trump administration has made decisions on the renewable volume obligations on time each year, Wheeler said that provides more certainty to the biofuels producers, American consumers, and he said we're going to continue that. Wheeler said the agency agency is looking at the small refiner exemptions and ty- uh, trying to provide more certainty around that. He also said the EPA is looking at the RVP situation, which is a key on being able to sell E15 year-round, saying they're looking at what they can do with that. However, he told the Sioux City Journal and the Des Moines Register in interviews he wanted to make sure that the EPA does have the legal authority to allow the year-round E15 sales. Kansas ranchers trying to hold herds together in the face of the severe drought this summer have several emergency programs available to them. Todd Domer reminds us here on a number of those drought options. The USDA Emergency Assistance for Livestock, Honeybees, and Farm-Raised Fish Program can provide assistance for losses resulting from the cost of transporting water to livestock in eligible drought areas. 
Notice must be provided to the local farm service agency office within 30 days after the loss is apparent, followed by submitting an application with records of the loss before November 1st. The deadline for emergency haying on Conservation Reserve program acres already has passed. Emergency grazing in the 43 qualified Kansas counties is authorized through September 30th. Grazing losses for eligible livestock producers could be compensated through the Livestock Forage Disaster Program. Check with your local Farm Service Agency office for eligibility details. The Kansas Natural Resources Conservation Service is offering Environmental Quality Incentives Program cost share funds for certain projects that address livestock water shortages. These funds are available in the 50 counties designated by Governor Jeff Collier in the most recent drought designation. The EQIP assistance may cover pipeline materials and installation, electric, wind, and solar-powered pumps, and new ponds. EQIP is not available for projects started or completed prior to application. The application deadline is August 24th. A similar program is being offered by the Kansas Department of Agriculture for livestock water supply projects started after June 1st, but before July 24th when EQIP cost share became available. I'm Todd Domer. And options for controlling invasive trees and plants on grazing lands. We'll highlight the educational program at the third and final Kansas Livestock Association, Kansas State University Ranch Management Field Day that is set for tomorrow in Lynn County at the Loma Land and Cattle Company located near Lacine, owned by the Robert Thayer family. They'll be hosting the event the third generation ranch, including a cow calf operation and backgrounding business there. Among the features, a panel will discuss what makes controlling invasive plants a challenge and provide options to lessen the burden. From the NRCS, Dane Varney will give tips on the best way to control invasive trees and explain NRCS cost share programs available to you producers. K State's Walt Fick on the program. He's conducted extensive research on herbicides for controlling invasive plants and grasslands, including Cerecia lespedeza and Old World Blue Stem. He'll discuss the findings. And a rancher from Parker, Greg Christensen, will talk about his experiences with using goats to control intensive grazing species. More on the program, of course. 3 o'clock for registration tomorrow afternoon, and then the program will begin at Loma Land and Cattle Company, south of Lacine. You're listening to Agriculture Today. Have you ever thought about where your food comes from? If you're thinking the grocery store, think again. Facts show that the American farmer feeds more than 129 people. They are continually increasing and improving their operations. A wide variety of crops and livestock are grown in Kansas as well as the United States, providing food to your dinner plate. Next time you see a farmer or rancher, thank them. For more information, contact K-State Research and Extension. This is Agriculture Today. Stop, look, and listen. This is our state, Kansas. What goes up must come down. But you tell me when and where. That's Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with comment on life in rural Kansas. I do not know what stopped him. He or she must have seen me as a large object coming its way. I saw it as a four-feet-long black snake coming up behind my truck as I walked by. It looked big to me and stopped me in my tracks. It was a beautiful snake, glossy black with long slender and tipped tail. It didn't look poisonous to me. However, I did not see any need for it to come closer to the house, nor for it to hide in the garage. So I grabbed a garden rake, a leaf rake, standing near the door to shoo it away. That showed its real character. Being a leaf rake, the teeth are springy, and as I gently directed the snake back the way it had come, I noticed that it became quite aggressive. It curled and twisted and only thought of going forward. 
A couple of times it struck at me, a quick, flashing movement, showing its grey throat and fangs. It was a small head, but probably could swallow more than I guessed. It's called a black rat snake. Its scales were a beautiful glossy black with brown-purple markings along the side with a creamy yellow belly. I kept gently thwarting its determined forward movement. The snake getting madder, the more determined I was. I was determined. I flipped it back to the group of cedars, and it landed, rolled, near the bench I have standing there. There in the shade, the snake slowly uncurled and crawled on the bench, gracefully stretched itself along and across the bench, twisting its body easily between the spaced boards. The middle section of the snake was as thick as my wrist. I wondered when and what his last meal had been. If he or she helps to keep the pack rats under control, I hope I have more of these snakes. And maybe I have. A few days ago I did step back when I became aware of a shiny, dried snakeskin hidden in the grass in front of me. I walked the path to turn the tap off, having just watered the plants. What did surprise me is that I held my foot up in the air, up off the ground, suddenly being aware of the skin. That must be an inborn reaction. We don't step on a snake. As the snake slid across the bench, it reached for the cedar tree behind the bench, and slowly moving its head, it circled the tree and started to climb. That I had never seen yet. I knew they can climb. I watched the snake move up a brick wall, but climbing a tree, a tall tree, up, up, all the way to the top, I had never seen. Leaning on my rake, I watched the snake go. I read that they will eat young birds beside rats. The cedar the snake climbed up into is one of a group of cedars connected to other trees along the open grassy hill. I watched the snake until it disappeared, tipping its tail. At the top, the tree must be 35 to 40 feet tall, and it did not take the snake long to slither up. I was impressed. The only eerie feeling I have now is when walking my wooded trails, I tend to look down or straight ahead, so I won't walk into spider webs. But now I have a feeling I might want to look up. Of course, the nature programs and other films on TV have shown tree-climbing snakes hanging down. But hey, this is Kansas. I will just have to shrug my shoulders and risk it. And I know the black rat snake is not poisonous. I'm glad I saw the snake, as I know there are bull snakes in and among the rocky and stony slope in front of the house, beyond the lawn and border. They also are non-poisonous, but they too can get big and fat. It's all part of living in the country and having created interesting surroundings or habitat. The other night, I must have caught a big, fat raccoon. I know because I found a live trap trashed. There had been a hole made by an earlier catch, which I had fixed. I had since caught a few squirrels and possums and released them on the farm. They come and hang around because of the bird spilled feed from the feeders. The raccoon goes for the greasy seed blocks I hang up for the woodpeckers and the flickers. I will have to move the blocks further away, out of reach. But let me tell you, raccoons are determined acrobats. But back to my snake. The last I saw was his tail slithering way up in the cedar tree top. From way up there, it could crawl any direction back to the grassy hill. The fact that the trees form a circle around the grassy open area makes it only more attractive for the red snake 
also the fact that there are several packrat nests along the stone wall. There should be plenty of meals for the snake, without too much effort, easily found. Now I wonder, what about the wood pile? Firewood stacked nicely in a large square pile, six feet high, at the edge of the woods? Of course, when I take the wood this fall, it will be cold again, and the snake will be slow. It surely won't lash out at me, as it did this morning. If I see it again, I'll try to catch it in a bucket, and take it to the old rock wall with the pack rat nests. Lunch is ready, or dinner is ready, and for that matter, have an early breakfast. Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with his weekly commentary on rural Kansas. Our time's away for today. We appreciate you tuning in and welcome you right back here tomorrow this same time. Until then, Eric Atkinson here for Agriculture Today. This is the K-State Radio Network.